Social distancing, you probably have heard this term or read it in the stores quite a bit these days. But did you know that this is not a new concept? In fact, thousands of years ago, people also had to socially distance themselves when they were sick. So in our lesson today, it actually talks about that a little bit. And our lesson takes place in the land of Israel. So if I were here in the US, I'd have to get in a plane and fly all the way, almost halfway across the world to here. And this was during the time Jesus was walking on this earth about 2,000 years ago. Now Jesus and his disciples, they were traveling south through the area of Galilee and Samaria when they were about to take a break. Now back then, when you had to travel, you couldn't just jump on a plane or take a bus. You had to walk most of the time. And so Jesus and his disciples were heading towards this town, ready to take a break, when 10 men came out to meet them. Now this was not the town's greeting committee. No, these men, they stood at a distance, socially distancing themselves because they were 10 lepers. That means they had some kind of skin disease that affected their whole body, and it probably produced lesions and sores, disfigurement, discoloration on their skins, and a certain type of leprosy also makes you unable to feel in your nervous system. And so if you got a cut in your hand, it might get infected, or you might not even notice that you have a cut. And people could lose limbs, they could lose fingers and toes, they could lose ears and noses that way. And so these 10 men, they had this problem. Now back then, when we didn't have microscopes yet, or we didn't know how germs and bacteria worked, God had already put some rules down for his people on how to keep themselves safe when diseases came among the people. And one of them was to socially distance themselves. In Leviticus, it tells us a lot of different laws God had. And one of them was that, ten, that lepers could not be close to people who were healthy. They had to stay outside of the towns and outside of the cities. And if there were people around, they would have to shout, unclean, unclean, to warn people that they had this problem inside their body. And so these men, they were separated. They were separated from their friends, their family. They could no longer work in the marketplaces or have a normal life. But there's a worse type of separation. And that type of separation is separation from God for all eternity. The thing that caused people to be separated from God is because people have chosen to sin. Back in the very beginning of the world, when Adam and Eve were first made, God gave them the ability to choose. And God gives us the ability to choose as well. And we chose very poorly. We chose to go against God by doing things that break his law. Another word for that is sin. And by doing sin, we deserve the punishment of eternal or forever separation from a good and holy God. In Isaiah 59, it tells us, but your iniquities or your sins have separated between you and your God. And everyone is born with the natural inclination or the nature to sin. So it's easy to cheat and steal, to lie, to think of yourself first, to be ungrateful. It's very natural for people to do that because we all have this problem of sin in us. And that sin causes us to be separated from God. And these men, to a lesser degree, they were separated from their loved ones because of this disease in their physical bodies. So these men, they stood far away as they were instructed before and instead, they had to cry out and shout with a loud voice. And this is what they said. They said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So they were calling out to Jesus, asking him for mercy, which is undeserved help, kindness, and compassion. They were asking for Jesus to help them, even if they did nothing to deserve it. And God gives you help and gives you love, even though you and I have done nothing to deserve it. You see, God is holy, which means he's perfect. He could do no wrong. And he is just. That means all his ways are true and fair. And so if he says that there's a punishment for doing sin, that's perfectly fair. It's perfectly right. But God is not only just, but he also loves his creation. He loves you. And he loves you even though you have this problem of sin. 
In Romans 5, it tells us that God commends his love even while we were yet sinners. That is amazing, undeserved love and compassion that God has for us, his most precious creation. Jesus also wanted to give undeserved love and compassion to these 10 men who were asking him for help. So what do you think Jesus did? Do you think he, was, he would say to them, no, you're sick, stay away from me? No, Jesus cared and he was going to help them. So Jesus told them something very interesting, something very strange. He said, go show yourself to the priests. And he did nothing else. You would think if I were trying to heal someone, I would give them maybe a medicine, maybe a vaccine, maybe even some herbs. But Jesus did none of that. He just said, go show yourself to the priest, which is something you would do only after you're starting to feel better or you've been healed. And so these 10 men had a choice now. Would they trust Jesus? Was Jesus trustworthy, even though he was saying such strange things? Well, in fact, Jesus is trustworthy because he is God the Son. And God cannot lie. He cannot have any sin in him. And so Jesus also could not have any sin in him, and he could not lie. Well, Jesus, he came to earth as a little baby, and he grew up living a perfect life, having the same temptations as we do, except with one difference. He never gave in to those wrong things. And when it was his time, he gave up that perfectly lived life on the cross, to die for the sins of the world. He was the only one who could pay that price and make the relationship that was broken complete again. It's only through his perfect blood that we could have forgiveness of sins. There was no other way for that punishment and that price to be paid. But Jesus did not stay dead. Three days later, proving that he could beat sin and beat death, he rose again and one day he will come back for those who believe in him. And so Jesus had the power to not only beat death and beat sin and rise from the dead and forgive us of our sins, but he also had the power to heal these men and save them from their separation. But it was the men's choice whether they would believe or trust in Jesus' words. You see, trusting means that there's a fact or there's a promise and you choose to believe in that promise or that fact and then act on it. And these 10 men had been given a promise and now it was their choice. Would they act on that? The Bible tells us what they did. In Luke 17, it says, and it came to pass that as they went, so they did it, they started going to the priest. What happens next? They were cleansed. So as they were going to show themselves to the priests, obeying Jesus' order, they were cleansed. It was a miracle. There was no other way to explain what happened to them while they're just walking along the way. So that was the result. That was the reward of their belief. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had been suffering from a disease that kept me separated from my friends and family for a very long time, and suddenly I had new hope, I would start thinking, I can go back to my friends. I can go back to my family. I can go home again. I can sleep in a bed. I can go into the marketplace. I don't have to live outside of the cities and the towns, completely separated. And maybe these men were thinking about themselves first because the Bible tells us that nine of them kept going on their way. But one man didn't think about himself first. One man remembered, I didn't just get healed by myself. I have someone I need to thank. And so this one man turned around and he went back to where Jesus was. And all the way on his way back, he was praising God with a loud voice. And when he came to Jesus, he fell down on his knees and he thanked Jesus for what he had done. So this man, he gave thanks when he saw what God had done for him. And he was extremely grateful. He didn't just feel grateful, but he actually expressed it. He showed it with his words and his actions. Now, if you have already believed in Jesus to save you from your sins, and you already belong to God as his child, 
then you can show thanks to him and to others with your words and actions in everything, not just in the good things. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, the Bible tells us, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What that verse is telling us is that God's promise to you as his child is that nothing ever happens out of his control. That in everything, whether it's something good or whether it's something bad, you can give thanks and have full faith and confidence that he will work it out for good. So not only when things are happening in your life that are good, but even in the stressful times or even in the times when you don't know what to do, one sure action you can always do is give God thanks and tell him, I trust you, even though I don't understand. So this man who already was healed, he remembered who he had to be thanking and he went back and thanked Jesus. And after the man was done thanking Jesus, Jesus talked to him and he asked, were there not 10 people that were healed? Where are the other nine? He was contrasting this one man's thankfulness and the other nine people's forgetfulness. But after that, Jesus says, you may go on your way. Your faith has made you well. These men were all made well because Jesus had given them a promise, a direction, and they in faith trusted Jesus' words and they acted on it. That's how they were made well. Well, if you are still separated from God in that broken relationship, Jesus has a promise for you. And that promise is found in John 5, 24, which says, and this is Jesus talking, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come unto condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And what that verse is saying, what Jesus was promising, is that if you believe that he is the one that can save you from your sin, and you believe the words of Jesus, and you choose to make him the Lord of your life, the master of your life, then you will be saved from your sin, and no longer will you be in eternal death, which means separation from God, but you will have eternal life, which means to be with God right now during your time here on earth, as well as after you die, you'll be with him forever in his family. So to believe in Jesus is a very serious decision because it changes, the com it completely changes the direction of your life. Do you believe that Jesus is the one who can save you from your sins? And will you choose to let him be the Lord of your life now and forever? If you're making that decision today, I encourage you to talk to God about this and then tell somebody who already believes in Jesus about the decision that you've made today. Now, if you have already believed in Jesus to save you from your sins, you can start being grateful to him and to others for the benefits and for the good things that they've given to you. So actually, I should do that right now. And I'm gonna thank my puppet helpers for managing my shadow puppets. So, puppet helpers, thank you so much for your help in doing all the shadow puppeting. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome, no problem. Yeah, no problem. You got it. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. So since we're talking about gratefulness, you can check out our other videos to see what this word means and how you can show gratefulness to God and to others. See you in our next video.